Hello everyone, welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm going to talk about some interview question and answers asked in a real DevOps interview. Yes, you heard it right. One of my friends who's a DevOps engineer, he appeared for an interview, okay, like a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I requested him to make note of all the questions that were asked to him. And uh, if he can share it with me, I'm going to make a video on it to share it with my audience. So here I am. So these are the real interview questions that were actually asked by an interviewer in a DevOps interview. All right. So, uh, so let's start with the first question. So the first question, as you can see on the screen, it's define pod lifecycle. Also, if you want to test your knowledge, you can just um, pause the video by seeing the question and then try to answer it yourself if you can. And then you can I mean, maybe uh, I mean, put it in the in the comment section. I mean, how many uh, when you were able to get it right? You were able to get right. Okay. So the first question is define pod life cycle. So I think you already know about this. This is like one of the easiest questions that can be asked. So it is related to Kubernetes application pods. All right. So let's just read through the answer. So the answer would be when the request to create a pod within the Kubernetes cluster is accepted, the pod goes into pending state. So this is the first uh, state that the the pod gets then this means that the pod is ready to be created but it has not been scheduled on any of the nodes within the cluster okay then when the scheduler has decided a node for this pod and when the image is being pulled the pod goes into creating state if the image is pulled and deployed as a container within the pod successfully the pod goes into running state okay so these are the different states that this pod acquires, okay, right from start to finish. So it starts with the uh, the spending state, then it goes to creating, then it goes to running state. If by any chance the pod fails or crashes by any reason, then it goes into error state, okay. So when a pod fails inside a cluster, the default behavior of a container inside a pod is to keep restarting it. Okay, I think there is some typo here so yeah so the default behavior of a container inside the pod is to try to restart it again and again until the pod is healthy okay so when that happens for a failed pod the status changes from error to crash loop back off okay then there are other pod statuses as well like image pull back off and some others so this is what the uh, i mean the exact answer should be when you are asked about pod life cycle Okay, I'm, I'm not going uh, in, into too many details of these, you uh, know, these concepts. Okay, so I mean, when I'm, uh, I'm covering the videos on Kubernetes, then I'm going to cover everything. Okay, but I just wanted to do, uh, sh uh, just share the, uh, the questions and answers that were uh, actually asked in the interview. All right. All right. So question number two, what are forward and reverse proxies? So once again, this is related to networking. And it may not be, uh, you know, a relevant question for, for a DevOps engineer, but you know, in DevOps interview, any, any, anything can be asked. Okay, it depends on the interviewer itself. I mean, what his or her background is, all right? And uh, I mean, he's going to keep, uh, you know, keep asking questions from his experience, okay? So I think that is what happened with my friend as well. So this was the second question. So uh, what are forward and reverse proxies? Once again, you can try to answer it if you can. All right. So the answer to this question is this. So let's talk about forward proxy first. So a forward proxy is a server that sits between client machines and internet. So whenever a client machine tries to access any content on internet, each request from the clients is intercepted by a forward proxy server before the request reaches a web server. The benefits is to hide client's IP address from web server to block access to certain sites using filtering rules. Now, what is the meaning of this? Let me just give you some some uh, insight into this. So I have I have prepared one diagram to explain these two concepts forward and reverse proxies. So let's learn the concept of forward proxy. So generally, I will I will give you a very real time example where it is exactly used. What is the use case of a forward proxy server? So basically, if you are working for a company, okay, inside the company, you are using a company's laptop and you are connected to company's network. Okay, 
from there if you try to access any website on internet okay so this means that you are inside the company's network and you are trying to access some websites on internet so what generally happens in in big organizations they will have something called as forward proxy server okay the reason they put it is to block access to some restricted sites okay i mean it can be inside it can be any uh, in uh, uh, appropriate sites as well you know so if, if, if you're trying to access any of those sites those sites will be blocked by this forward proxy server because this proxy server will have certain filtering rules applied okay so i mean you cannot access all the websites okay from a company's network on internet okay so so this is the uh, the most important use case of a forward proxy server and that is what it is mentioned here also if you just read through these four lines again and the benefits of course to hide clients ip addresses from the web server so that it cannot be hacked okay so uh, so i mean whenever you are trying to access any website from a company's network to internet which has uh, this forward proxy server installed as well then in that case internet will only be exposed to the forward proxy server and and not to the main client ip so in this way you are you know are trying to protect your uh, a client's ip addresses means suppose there is some critical data that is stored on this laptop and, and 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 if you're trying to access some website which can hack the data from your laptop so in that case it is very useful so this this proxy server is going to block a lot of uh, you know i mean uh, uh, it's going to hide your uh, main ip address so that it cannot be exploited in any way okay so to hide client's ip address from web server to block access to certain sites using filtering rules as i just mentioned all right let's talk about reverse proxy now yeah so reverse proxy is a server that sits between internet and web servers so whenever a client machine tries to access any web server from internet each request from the clients is intercepted by a reverse proxy server before the request reaches a web server benefits to protect a website example ddos attacks by hiding the ip addresses of the website from clients load balancing it also does load balancing it also uh, helps in caching some static content it can also perform ssl encryption okay so uh, let's talk about prox uh, this reverse proxy server now once again i have a diagram to explain the concept so reverse proxy is like just the opposite opposite of the of the forward proxy server so what usually happens so this is like suppose you you are uh, i mean you have a website which is in the company's network and uh, this is the company's web server you can say okay now if you are an external user trying to access this website from outside means from internet okay in that case uh okay i think i did not put the proxy server itself so let me just complete the diagram just a moment so proxy server so proxy server would come somewhere yeah this is better so just understand it like this so suppose <clears throat> suppose you have a website which is the uh, uh, company's website okay i mean which you have uh, deployed and and you are maintaining as a devops engineer for example all right now this website is a is a public facing website which is accessed by external users or external clients okay so in this case you are trying to protect this particular web server because this is internal to the company and uh, i mean it uh, i mean uh, it could be a, like a critical website to the to the company and you are trying to you know you are trying to protect it from any any attacks that could happen to the website so in that case what you can do is you can use this reverse proxy server okay so any client or any external user who is trying to connect to this website from internet then once again you are trying to hide your main web server in this case and you are just putting it this one more uh, uh, this this uh, 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 
this server in, 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 in the middle so that you can save your main web server. Okay, the benefits are, the benefits are you can protect your website. So this is one of the attacks, DDoS, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service. Okay, this, this is one of the, uh, you know, I mean, one of the most, uh, what do you call, um, uh, most widely used cyber attack these days. Okay. Uh, there are some more as well, but this is, I mean, one of one of those, I mean, one of, I mean, uh, one of those uh, cyber attacks that you know generally happens. Okay, so to protect your website from DDoS attacks, you can hide its IP addresses from the website. Okay, I mean, you can hide the IP address, IP address of the website from the clients. So in this in this diagram, you can see when a client is trying to access the website. Okay, he cannot access the website directly. He has to connect to the this reverse proxy server and from here he has to go to the web server okay so in this way you have been able to hide your main web server which is really critical to your company okay so <clears throat> this is one thing then if you have like I mean, I mean multiple web servers you know which are used by the external users to access your application in that case this reverse proxy server can also work as a load balancer to balance the load Okay, between you no know, different uh, different web servers, it can work as uh, it can work with uh, I mean uh, for that benefit as well. And apart from that, it it can also cache static content as well. Okay, and also it can perform SSL encryption, which means you can use I mean you can encrypt the data. Okay, that is being sent to your reverse proxy server. Now, if you have heard about uh, the concept in Kubernetes called uh, ingress. So, so that is actually a deployment of reverse proxy server only. And there are, you know, I mean, various uh, uh, ingress controllers available like Nginx is there, HA proxy, traffic. Uh, then you also have uh, ALB. So there are other, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into too many uh, details of that, but I'm just giving you a very random example that even the I mean, modern DevOps tools uses the concept of reverse proxy. So that that ingress controller is actually a reverse proxy setup okay that is used and it works in the same way as this diagram okay i hope the concept is clear to you if you have any questions you can always put it in the comment section all right let's move on to the next question next is what is a cve i'm not sure if uh you have uh, I mean, heard this term but this is actually a very common term in DevOps world, or you can say in the uh, in the world of IT, so CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. <clears throat> the meaning of this this term is: suppose you have a website, or you have a web server, or you have a Docker image, okay, that you are using as part of your DevOps work. Now, each image, or each resource, or each server, or each website, okay, in an organization where you're working, is always scanned for security vulnerabilities okay now each security vulnerability that you have been able to detect has something called as cve id attached to it okay the meaning of cve id is cve id i mean you can use this cve id to search in a central repository of a publicly known security vulnerabilities okay to check the details of that security vulnerability and also, it will have the steps to remediate the vulnerability. So that is what CVE is. So let's just go through the answer now. So CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. There is a central repository which contains a list of publicly exposed vulnerabilities standardized by MITRE. Okay. So this is the organization that is managing this database. And here is the website. This repository has vulnerabilities listed from different vendors. It can be Red Hat, it can be Microsoft, it can be CrowdStrike, or it can be Azure, okay, it can be AWS, anything. I mean, all the vulnerabilities that have been detected by different vendors, okay, with their products. So all the I mean publicly known security vulnerabilities can be found on this URL. And uh, this is like a database of all those all those vulnerabilities maintained by MITRE. Okay, and you, you, you also get the URL pointing to the vendor article for a particular vulnerability. Okay, and then there's one more thing. Each vulnerability has something called a CVSS score, which is going to quantify the impact. So for example, 
there is some vulnerability which has score as 8 or 9 which means that this is actually i mean quite critical and if there is a security vulnerability which has score like 3 or 4 you can say that it is, it is i mean not that critical and we have i mean more time to resolve the vulnerabilities so so this is the concept of cve and this is also also you know uh, one of the most important concepts because in the in the world of devops you have to uh, take care of security as well security means you have to ensure that all your resources all your you know i mean all, all, all the things that you are um, creating and managing are secured at all times so this is, this is one of the ways of doing that all right next question what is wireshark okay so wireshark is a very famous network tool which is used for once again checking the network attacks you know uh, for, for any i mean malicious network activity that can happen in your organization so you can use this tool to detect that and remediate it so wireshark is an open source open network sniffing tool or, or sniffing software which is designed to track network packets by using various filter options available it is used to analyze network packets or troubleshoot network issues to check malicious and hacking possibilities generally used to trace a protocol related information okay there are various videos on youtube and other platforms where where you have uh, i mean i mean uh, where you can get all the details of how to install, configure, and use Wireshark tool for a network uh, tracing. Okay, so this is about Wireshark. Now, next question: What is Apache Tomcat? I think you all m might have heard this word. So it is sometimes asked in the interview. Like, I mean, what actually is Apache Tomcat? You should be able to answer the question. So Apache Tomcat is a widely used open source web server and Java servlet container. Okay, created by Sun Microsystems as the reference implementation of Java servlet and Java server pages. And it was actually donated to Apache Software Foundation. So, I mean, this information is not that critical, but I just wanted to I mean, give you some background on that. So, so basically Apache Tomcat is a web server, okay, that you can use to host your static content. Also, you can use it for your dynamic content as well using JSPs or Java servlet containers. Okay. Or you can say uh, it, it can serve your Java server pages. So generally it is used with Java application. I mean, most of the times and uh, it can uh, be used to host static and dynamic contents. So advantages, it serves as both a web server and servlet container. It is free and open source. It is lightweighted. It is highly adaptable due to built-in customization feature. It is a very stable web server. It has very good documentation that you can find on internet. Okay, but there are some disadvantages as well. Uh, there is some problem with SSL setups generally. It is it is not an easy process to set up SSL with Apache Tomcat. There are issues related to uh, memory leaks and it does not manage logs well and it has a poor user interface but even then it is a very popular tool uh, you know that has been used from a very long time by a lot of people who wants to deploy their web applications all right for more information you can I mean, go to internet and you can check other videos as well on youtube and other platforms you will get ample information if you want to learn more about apache tomcat but this was one of the questions that was asked in that interview Okay, so you, you better be prepared for this. All right, next is what is Nginx? So Nginx again is a web server that accept HTTP and HTTPS requests and displays the web content by delivering web pages to users. Nginx is also used as load balancer, reverse proxy, mail proxy and HTTP cache. So once again, it is one of the uh, you can say the modern version of a web server which is you know i'm getting really popular it is uh, i mean uh, there's a competition between apache and nginx but nginx is actually winning it now because it is like a I mean, modern web server which has easier uh, you know configuration or easier documentation to follow as compared to apache which is kind of a legacy web server now so once again it it is used to manage HTTP and HTTPS request. Once again, if you talk about your Kubernetes concepts, in Kubernetes you have something called as ingress controller. Okay, so this is one of the ingress controllers there, which is used to manage your HTTP and HTTPS requests. You know, 
uh, coming from outside to inside of the cluster inside of the cluster and uh, it is used to deliver uh, web pages to users and as i mentioned nginx is used as a reverse proxy so that in ingress controller is a reverse proxy setup there which is managing your http and https traffic so this is one of the main use cases of nginx in the world of devops but in general it's a web server all right next question what are quality gates <clears throat> So quality gates, uh, if you have heard about a tool called Sonar Cube, which is generally used in uh, your CI CD pipelines, especially when you're using Jenkins tool. So with Jenkins, if you have uh, configured a tool for static code analysis of your built artifact, so you can use Sonar Cube for that. In Sonar Cube, you have various options, and one of the options is quality gates. So so quality gates is, is just a way by which or you can say some conditions that you put your built artifact through and see if those conditions are passed by your artifact or not. If, if, if it passes, then it means it's, it's, it's a good build. Okay, if not, then you can say that this is not a good build. Okay, so okay, I think I skipped one slide here. So there were two questions asked. What are quality gates? and how to confirm that a built artifact is good so for both these questions answer is the same okay because these quality gates are used to confirm that a built artifact is good okay so <clears throat> so what are quality gates it enforces a quality policy in your organization to define a set of conditions against which projects are measured so it is always you know in, in numbers you know uh, that you have to manage i mean uh, that you have to count the quality of your built artifact okay so you want to quantify your built artifact in terms of its quality all right so <clears throat> if you see here your projects are measured okay so example when you are using sonar cube scanner in a jenkins pipeline to perform static code analysis you use these quality gates to to set some measurable criteria to ensure that your built artifact passes that okay some of the some of the examples of of that criteria that you pass your built artifact through is code uh, this code coverage should be greater than or equal to 80 percent this is like a standard this means that your sonar cube static code analysis should at least scan 80 percent of your total code okay then the second condition is the security rating should be a which means there should be no vulnerabilities no bugs no code smells in your co in your built artifact at all uh, the the rating of the security should be a then reliability rating accordingly it should be a and if you have some duplicated lines of code that should not be uh, greater than 3 okay so it should be less than or equal to 3 at all times so this so so these are some of the parameters that are there in the quality gates okay when you when you uh, i mean pass your built artifact through this okay and and for more information you can follow this documentation page and it's going to give you all the information related to quality gates all right next question is what are different type of attacks like ddos so it is asking i mean the interviewer is asking here what are the what are, i mean what are the different type of cyber attacks that can happen okay so So these are the I mean so these are some of the uh, the most commonly uh, you know used cyber attacks these days by the hackers. So one is a malware attack. You have DDoS, which I spoke about in in the in the previous slides. Then you have phishing attacks. You have ransomware. You have SQL injection attacks. You have sm uh, smishing attack. You have a packet sniffer. You have a botnet. There could be more, but I think this is I mean, more than sufficient to answer. Uh, in, in an interview and the interview will understand that you know about the different cyber attacks all right last question is what i uh, what is cidr now this actually sounds very easy but actually the interviewer ask, is asking here the concept of cidr i mean why you're using cidr concept okay in general so cidr stands for a classless interdomain routing okay so generally what happens <clears throat> I mean, what used to happen in the past, we used to use the uh, classful IP addresses, okay? 
so i mean once again i'm i'm not going to go into too, too much of detail what what is the meaning of this class for this but you can say there are some ranges of ip addresses which were divided into separate classes like class a class b class c like that okay but what used to happen with those classful ip addresses is a lot of the ip addresses were getting wasted because of that so to avoid that or to you know to to uh, i mean yeah to to see that we are not wasting any of these ip addresses this new concept called cidr or classless interdomain routing or you can say the classless type of ip addresses were introduced and this class a class b class c was uh, you know was uh, i mean uh, it was deprecated you can say so i mean people nowadays are using cidr ip addresses instead of the classful ip addresses that were being used previously okay the main reason is to avoid wastage of ip addresses because cidr always assigns the ip addresses to resources in sequence okay so, so let's just read about this cidr so cidr stands for classless interdomain routing it is a networking concept designed to replace the outdated way of classful addressing system as i just mentioned it helps in low wastage of ip addresses as the ip addresses are assigned in sequence so number of addresses in a cidr block will always be the power of 2 okay so so these are some of the rules of of a cidr ip addressing scheme okay now uh, if you remember when i uh, when i spoke about vpc or i mean if if you watched my vpc video there you have the option of choosing a cidr at the start of the vpc creation so that cidr is the range of ip addresses that you want to use with your vpc okay so that cidr is same as this cidr and and this is the concept of uh, i mean how to use classless uh, ip addressing scheme all right guys these are, so these were the questions i wanted to discuss in this video i hope you like the video if you have any any feedback any uh, any you uh, know uh, any any suggestions uh, i mean you can always put it in, in the comment section and i am going to reply to all your queries all right i hope you like the video and i'm going to see you in the next one all right guys bye for now